Good evening, everyone. My name is Shannon Romine, and this is Matthew Thomas, and we are the co-presidents of the United Nations Student Alliance. Um, today, we have the Mr. Ambassador Tahuri here today, and we also have Dr. David Randall. And Dave, or Matthew's going to talk to you about what we do here at school. All right, hello, everyone. Uh, there's probably going to be a couple more people trickling in uh, as we speak, so just don't mind them as we continue our event. Now today, we're going to be talking about global partnership. It's, one, it's the eighth millennium developmental goal, and there are five different targets that the United Nations has within this goal. Now I'm going to read them off to you. The first one is to develop further an open, rule-based, predictable, non-discriminatory trading and financial system. The second is to address the special needs of least developed countries, landlocked countries, and small island developing states in cooperation with pharmaceutical companies provide access to affordable essential drugs in developing countries. Four, deal comprehensively with developing countries debt. Five, in cooperation with the private sector, make available benefits of new technologies and especially ICTs. So now, when you listen to these next two speakers, everyone always has questions on how they can get involved with certain issues relating to the United Nations. These are very big tasks to be handled. So please listen to, think of how you could have your own role in dealing with these issues, whether it's raising awareness, whether you're into business, if you're a nurse, whatever you are, just really thinking how you can make a difference. So our next, our first guest is the CEO and president of the Whale Center. Um, everyone, please help me introduce Dr. Dave Randall. Thank you, Matthew. Um, greetings, uh, Ambassador Chowdhury. Um, see Tim Kennedy, who's on our UNA board, and Javier. Can our UNA board members stand up, uh, the other group that's, that's here? <clears throat> Great. And thank you all for coming out on a Friday evening. <clears throat> you must be like Ambassador Chowdhury and I. We didn't get tickets to the uh, royal wedding either, so we're here tonight <clears throat> with you instead. So. I want to talk tonight about one piece of the Millennium Development Goals, that piece having to do with the economics and financing, and particularly related to the U.S.'s positions and opportunities and obligations in that regard. So I will begin, and um, please uh, uh, feel free to um, ask questions at any point if, if I'm moving too fast or something isn't clear. But I want to talk about the goals <clears throat> in terms of the context of caring for the planet. It's really about changing values. I had the opportunity to um, go to the premiere of the movie Superman years ago. I was working with uh, John Denver, the entertainer at the time, and he did it as a benefit. <clears throat> and I remember this person from the movie industry commenting that um, he just hopes the movie will have a good market share. And I thought about that. Here Superman is supposed to be uh, fighting for truth, justice, and the American way, but they're really more concerned about him fighting for market share. And unfortunately, I think this is a lot of what our uh, politics and our economics have degenerated to. Not necessarily what's true, not necessarily what's just, not necessarily what is historically been the American way in terms of values. And that's what really needs to shift of the Millennium Development Goals are going to succeed. The United Nations Environment Program <clears throat> talks about these issues in terms of four divides. The first they call is the environmental divide, where they point out we've had improved environments in many ways in the rich countries, we see that in North America uh, since the 70s. We have made gains with the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, um, more control on pesticides and pollution. But we've actually seen degraded environments in many of the developing nations of the world. The World Wildlife Fund puts it together on this graph, and you can see 
those high-income countries where their living planet index is versus the low-income countries represented by the yellow. The second is what they call the policy divide. Policy development, we find the developed nations going back 40 years ago, in 1970, pledged to give 0.7% of their GNI, gross national income, to help the developing countries of the world. But the actual implementation of that policy has not been quite as good. After 40 years, the average is only about 0.35% being given each year. 40 years later, and these countries are only 50% of the way there. The third divide is the lifestyle divide. We find today the richest one-fifth of the world is consuming 80% of the world's resources, while the poorest one-fifth of the world consumes only 1% of the world's resources. And this creates a vulnerability gap by income. This graph here, the dark blue nations have over four times as much the median income globally. The light blue, one and a quarter to four times. The pink, or the average, three quarters to one and a quarter. <clears throat> the orange, only a quarter to three quarters. And the red, less than one quarter. And you can see how this is distributed by regions around the world. And this also impacts life expectancy. The higher the income, the greater the life expectancy is, with the red here being the uh, lowest income and the blue being the highest income. And that translates into a difference of 15 years average life expectancy between what you see here in this graph of the orange countries in Africa versus the green countries in the developed part of the world. One third of the world, think about that, one out of three people are living on this planet with less than $2 a day income. And a billion of those people are living on less than $1 per day. 10% of the world's population is getting 54% of all the global income, while 40% only gets 5% of that income. If you take the poorest 10% of the U.S. population and you average that income of our poorest 10% in this nation, it's still more than two-thirds of the world make an income. Think about that for a minute. Our poorest 10% averages more money a year than two-thirds of the entire world averages. That's how much of vulnerability gap we have on the planet. <coughs> Here in our own country, in the US, the gap is also changing. The gap between the rich and the poor grows about the same pace as economic growth. The richest 1% in this country now own 40% of the total property, while 80% of the citizens own just 16%. Since the 90s, 40% of the increase in wealth went to the pockets of the rich minority 1%, while only 1% of that went to the 80% poor majority. From 77 to 99, the after-tax income of the richest 20% of American families increased by 43%, while the poorest 20% decreased by 9%, allowing for inflation. So the actual income of the poor Americans is decreasing more than it was 30 years ago, while the wealthy <clears throat> are accumulating more and more of both income and wealth. So UNEP says there's really four scenarios which nations of the world are choosing in different emphasis or combination. 
The first is the security scenario where certain nations decide the way to deal with these problems is to increase our military. By increasing our military, we'll be able to protect what is ours better. We'll be able to take from others, if necessary, what we need. We'll be able to defend our resources around the globe, wherever they are, as long as we have a strong security force to do so. The problem with that <clears throat> is it doesn't always work out the way people plan. I had an opportunity years ago, right after the Iraq war started, to sit down and have a coffee with a recently retired CIA operative who had been in the Mideast his whole career, and he was enthusiastic about the Iraq war. And he said, the only thing I don't like about this war is the president is not telling us why we're fighting it, not telling us the real reason why we're fighting it. But we're really doing it for a good cause. And I said, well, what is the good cause from his perspective? The good cause, he said, is we're keeping, we're not there to get the Iraqi oil, we're there to keep the Chinese from getting that oil. And by keeping the Chinese from getting that oil, it allows us more time to be economically competitive <clears throat> and to uh, adjust to their rising stature in the world, which was happening at a much too rapid pace in his mind. So we have our security force, we have our military, we go to Iraq to protect where that oil goes. The only problem is, in order to fund this effort, where do we get the money? Right, China. We borrow the money from China to fund the war in Iraq to keep the Chinese from getting the oil. But when the Iraqi government finally takes control of the oil resources, who is their first client? China. So you can see this security scenario doesn't always work out <clears throat> very good. The second is the market scenario. People argue we just need to allow the free market to take its course and it'll do everything properly and work itself out. The problem with this scenario is what do you do when a country takes the quick short-term profit which the market allows in order to get some profit but destroys all the farmland, all the agricultural land? Then all of a sudden the people need food. Ambassador Chowdhury, I think, was telling us about a story of a, a nation that, that developed a program and the people actually lost their water. And so, you know, we can't reverse these things if we allow the market to be the only deciding factor. So the market scenario has major limitations as well. The policy scenario, I think we've all seen the failures of that. I gave one example already where we had a good policy of the 0.7%. So the policy is good, but the implementation doesn't always accompany it. And we've seen the same, whether it's biodiversity or emissions issues with climate change or water issues. The gap between the actual policy and the implementation of that policy doesn't get the job done. So UNEP has concluded the only real solution is what they call the sustainability scenario, where the world works in unity to become a sustainable planet. And if we can't get on that track, if we can't get on that shift in values, then we're all going to be in serious trouble. This is a picture taken with satellite imagery of every square mile of the world at nighttime. And it shows you a good picture of where development has taken place and where it hasn't. You can see um, that in the United States and in Europe, we have a lot of lights, India, China, and other parts of the world, relatively dark. Our planet at night, though, only tells part of the story where we see <clears throat> the lights in Europe, it's not necessarily that Europe 
has a large population as much in some cases as they have more wealth to light up <clears throat> the cities and the country. Where in Africa, where they may have bigger population centers, you don't really see it at night because they don't have the company development to go with it. And here you see Australia, where you see lights around the coastal cities and the great uh, deserts, of course, are darker, a country that has a little bit of both. And here you see um, India with patches of lights. Even though they have very large populations, the lights are not as dense as other places less populated, such as the United States, where you see our lights uh, on the east of the Mississippi and east coast and the west coast taking prominence. Our population trends are also impacting the success of the Millennium Development Goals. This is a projection uh, put together through the UN which shows <clears throat> where they project population to be by the year 2050. Note that the developing industrialized countries do not have near the rapid increase of population that the developing countries do. And yet the Millennium Development Goals are designed to help who? Not the developed countries, but the developing countries. So this increases our challenge even more so. Part of the goals, as you recall, are like to reduce the, the number of people without safe water by half. But if the population keeps increasing, not reducing by half, maybe we're just exactly where we were because the populations increase so much and half is so much bigger. So there's some limitations with that goal without addressing these trends. And many people say, well, <clears throat> if only we could get India and China to get their act together, which are about a third of the world's population, we would have the problem solved. But look at this next graph. The population you see here, China at the bottom, the red being India, they're not the major problems for future projections. It's the poor developing countries where this is going to happen. So if you think it's all about China and India, think again. That's not where the development problem is taking place. Coupled with this is what we call our ecological footprint. <clears throat> the earth can only sustain at a level of consumption so many people. Now, you can sustain more if you reduce your level of consumption or if you have less people. But you've somehow got to come into balance to have an ecological footprint. <clears throat> and this graph here is perhaps one of the most scary because you can see that the North American countries, US and Canada, have already exceeded almost by half, or two thirds rather, the carrying capacity that we have. In other words, if we had to be dependent just on our own resources, we could not do it in North America. We've already exceeded that by two thirds. Europe is even worse. They, they've exceeded by double what they can uh, get. Uh, we have a little bit of um, play in the non-EU part of Europe. And the, the Middle East has exceeded it. Uh, Latin America is the one area of the world that has not exceeded the carrying capacity. The Asia Pacific areas are already over the threshold, and the African continent is coming close to the threshold. So where do these developed countries get their resources from to maintain these unsustainable lifestyles? They get them either through the poorest of the poor, or they change their values and lifestyles and consumption patterns so they don't need as much to begin with. These are really serious challenges because we're getting to that tipping point where there is going to be no more places to plunder. 
There are very few people who dare to visualize the future. And as you do it for a nation, we have to have the courage to visualize the future for the world as a whole. This planet is not managed. The political system which we have for this planet is appalling. If a team from outer space would come down here, they would say, you must be kidding. <laughs> that is definitely not a way of, of managing a planet. They would give us F in planetary management. <laughs> what we have done in the United Nations, what I told you, was done for a budget that is less than one-third of a nuclear trident a year. The whole United States contribution to the United Nations is equal to what the United States is paying for its military music. <laughs> it is, for me, it is appalling to see what the, United, what the world spends on its global management. It is a scandal. And it is a scandal what we're paying, uh, and not paying, rather, for planetary management. Think about that. We spend more on the military bands than our contribution to the United Nations as a country and the U.S. And F in planetary management that Robert Mueller suggested we would get, and he should know. He served as Under Secretary General of the U.N. for 40 years and then founded the uh, University for Peace in, in Costa Rica and has traveled around the world and seen many different aspects of politics and planetary management. This is why I want to focus my remarks tonight on this issue of that commitment I mentioned earlier, the 0.7 percent target. This is the target that refers to the repeated commitment of the world governments to commit 0.7 percent of the richest country's gross national income, GNI, to the official development assistance. This, as I mentioned, was first pledged 41 years ago in 1970 in a General Assembly resolution and has been affirmed in agreements over the years, including the March 2002 International Conference on Financing for Development in Monterey, Mexico, and at the World Summit on Sustainable Development held in Johannesburg, South Africa later that year, as well as incorporated to be part of the Millennium Development Goals. Why this matters for the Millennium Development Goals is the analysis indicates that the 0.7% of the rich world GNI can provide enough resources to meet the goals of every developed country set and followed through on a timetable to reach that by 2015, the world could make dramatic progress in the fight against poverty and start a path to achieve the goals and end extreme poverty within a generation. Now, what is the cost to us U.S. citizens to do that? Over the 15-year period of the Millennium Development Goals was estimated to cost anywhere from $75 to $150 per person over that period, depending on what our gross national income would be, whether it was high, low, and so forth. $75 to $150 over a 15-year period doesn't seem much of a sacrifice given what we end up spending other resources on. And it also matters, the 0.7 percent matters for global security. The target has been recognized as a vital step towards promoting international and national security and stability. For example, the report of the Secretary General's high-level panel on threats, challenges, and change recommends that countries that aspire to global leadership through permanent membership on the UN Security Council should be required to fulfill international commitments to official development assistance, including the 0.7 percent target. So how are the countries of the world doing? There are some countries that are doing very well. Denmark, Luxembourg, Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, 
all of these countries have actually not only met the goals, they've surpassed the goals. And in one given year, Sweden actually had 1.12% of their GNI that went to development assistance. So it can be done. The United States, in 1970, when we first agreed to this goal, we were almost there. We were at 0 0.65, almost at the 0 0.7 level. But then something happened. We needed more resources for Vietnam. We needed more resources for the next war and the next war, et cetera, et cetera. And our level of giving decreased where it got down to a low of 0 0.1 the lowest giving of per capita of any developed country in the world. And then President Bush, second George Bush, infused some money into Africa for AIDS, malaria, development assistance, and we went up. We went up, so we were the second worst country, surpassing Italy. And then the economy went bad. When the economy goes bad, what else goes bad? Our GNI goes lower. So under Obama administration, we've actually gone up a little bit. We've gone up to 0.21. But we've gone up more because the economy's been bad than we've been really increasing our giving in terms of dollars. Some countries have actually gotten worse, like Austria, Greece, Italy, Japan, while most have pretty much in the last five years stayed about the same, knowing how significant these goals are for achieving success. We all have choices in everything we do and how we direct our resources. We have choices as a government, we have choices as individuals. And if you don't think your little bit of money can make a difference, I want to share one story. Um, Sarah McLaughlin, the, the singer, was asked how much it would cost to produce a video, music video, and the average cost was $150,000, which is not a lot in the Hollywood music business, but it was kind of a sticker shock for her when she started thinking about what else that money might be used for. So I want to pause here for a second and share um, this video clip um, of her um, story. Makes a huge difference in what we do in our policy and our lives. We are facing an ethical and spiritual crisis and time is running out. This is why we founded the Global Healing Initiative in cooperation with the URI and UNEP, where Adnan Amin commended it as a very necessary program <clears throat> with the idea that we are one human family, one planet, one people. I invite you to join the Global Healing Network and be part of a global community working to bring peace justice, and healing for the earth. Real people are depending on us to make these ethical choices. Thank you.